Thank you very much for inviting me anyway, Basic. I'm uh, <clears throat> very pleased to have this opportunity to share some thoughts with you. I intend to keep it fairly, um, fairly short um, and uh, hope that uh, I can uh, provoke some discussion later on in the panel discussion. Uh, mindfulness and what else it takes to do intercultural business communication. The, uh, the questions I want to share with you um, are these. The first one of the title itself. Um, second one, what does intercultural competence consist of? <clears throat> Third one, can we actually develop it uh, or does it just develop? Um, indeed, one question as well, which I think is worth asking in this current um, audience is uh, to what extent is intercultural competence actually the development, the job of business English trainers? Um, I think some people have been discussing that in the chat as well while we've been listening to others. And finally, uh, is there a guiding principle for doing intercultural business communication? Um, obviously, my answer to that is yes, it's mindfulness, but we'll come to that later on. So if you ask people this first question, the man on the street, the woman on the street, Joe Punter out there, what does it take to communicate successfully across cultures, um, probably most people will come up with um, the you know the informed lay person will say, well, you need to be able to speak a foreign language or a lingua franca, and and of course it would probably also help to have some knowledge of the target culture that you're actually dealing with, um, and this might seem quite obvious to business English trainers that that is th these are actually key parts of what you need to communicate successfully and interact successfully across cultural borders. But um, the question is that, that I think a lot of people, have, uh, a lot of researchers have been looking at um, for quite a long time now, is, is that all? And um, what's quite interesting is the, the range of uh, term that um, has been used to, to describe this all. Um, when Helen Spencer Oti and I wrote the book uh, that is plugged in the margin of the current slide, we came across dozens of uh, different terms used to mean more or less the same thing. Um, this, what it is, this ability to create, to communicate, to interact successfully across cultures. And because we thought that we wanted to put our own mark on the on the field, we, we added to the jungle of terms by uh, inventing another one: intercultural interaction competence. What these terms, all these conceptualizations, all share in common. What do they all share? What do they all have in common? Um, well, certainly, obviously, the competence not only to communicate um, verbally, non-verbally, but other, other aspects as well um, behave. I think a very important additional uh, aspect that we have to bring in here, we're not only talking about communication, but we're, particularly in business, we're talking about doing things together, behaving together, getting things done together. Uh, fulfilling uh, corporate aims together. So rather through communication, admittedly, but also through interaction, through behavior. Um, the next uh, characteristic of uh, these, all these definitions, these conceptualizations, is the, the effectiveness um, aspect. It has to be done effectively. It has to lead to success and appropriateness, something that we're all familiar with. Business English trainers are all familiar with the appropriateness concept from the communicative approach to language teaching, effectively and appropriately with people from other groups, yes, uh, but also to handle the psychological demands and dynamic outcomes that result from such interchanges. This is a the psychological side of um, intercultural competence, intercultural interaction competence, which goes far beyond those elements of uh, language skills, foreign language skills, and um, cultural knowledge that we talked about in Joe Punter's uh, answer to the question. Um, this might or might not be correct, um, it, but it, what is certainly the case is not particularly useful. It's not particularly this conceptualization is not particularly useful to um, people like yourselves, like my, me as well, who are actually trying to help people in business and management to communicate internationally. And so. Um, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly does this this um, this consist of? Um, intercultural interaction competence. It's um, and here uh, I wanted to share with you the results. I've taken one example at random, a famous study by Kuhlmann and Stahl some ten years ago, twelve years ago, just as an example of the kind of answers that have come up to this question: What does intercultural competence consist of in the business world? 
And um, Kumar Manishtal asked uh, collected critical incidents, uh, Evan mentioned this term earlier, critical incidents from inter returning expatriate managers, um, and asked them all, you know, to describe their uh, problems in international management as expats, and how, um, how they solve these problems, a classical critical incident approach. Um, and they came up with this list of, uh, how many is it, seven, seven competencies. Um, tolerance for ambiguity, you can read them all yourself. I don't need to uh, read them through for you. But what, of course, is striking about this list, and this is not untypical, this is not untypical of the research into intercultural uh, competence in business and management settings, is that language, foreign language skills, and cultural knowledge do not appear. Slight proviso there, the last bullet point, meta-communicative competence, the ability to talk about communication, to talk about what is going wrong, what is going right, to talk about creating understanding. That, of course, is something that is done in language and requires language skills as well. But generally, the competences that um, are mentioned here, that uh, Kuhlman and Stahl found out, are, are um, singularly lacking in the uh, connection to culture and language. Um, if we look at more research um, that has been done over the years since the 1970s, by mainly by US Americans, but also by Europeans, um, uh, we can see, again, the same sort of things recurring. Um, not so much the uh, language. Language does occur um, from time to time. Knowledge of other cultures does occur from time to time. But a vast, vast variety uh, of skills which of competences which in my view probably go far beyond um, the um, duties of a, of, a, of a language trainer or even a cultural trainer that of course is a big question um, we tried to in our book um, uh, intercultural interaction Helen and I tried to bring order to this chaos of insights from mainly empirical studies and came up with a four um, headed uh, framework which gathers these various competences uh, into a more manageable uh, type of uh, categories which might also be interesting um, for language trainers. I don't want to go into that too much now but I'd just like to share with you perhaps a more uh, easily a more compact uh, model um, devised by Chen and Sarosta who um, put together similar categories to ours. But again, what is absolutely striking is, and here I put it in yellow, how much or how little is language and how, how, how much and how little is culture, rather more, and how um, much of the model are other competencies. Um, yeah, so what does it, to answer the question, what does intercultural interaction competence consist of? The ability to master affective processes, behavioral processes, and cognitive processes, the ABC competencies, which um, may uh, be useful to people in trying to get around this question of how do we train people, how do we develop people to be more successful at the intercultural interface in business and management. ABC competencies, a highly, highly varied set, and of which language proficiency and culture-specific knowledge are only two. And this, I think, is where uh, it was question four um, for uh, language trainers um, who are encouraged to um, set or who want to develop uh, intercultural business and management competencies in their trainees, yet to what extent is it part of their